What is the secret that makes Bruce Willis so exciting to people? I think because I, the characters that I play are, you know, people that um, maybe they know. Maybe they've, in, you know, known someone like David Addison. Maybe they've known someone like John McClane. Um, I don't really analyze it that much. I, um, I'm very surprised, very, you know, pleasantly surprised that, you know, people respond the way they do to, uh, to my work. Um, especially in this film, you know, in <sighs> Die Hard. Um, I was at the theater Friday night and, uh, saw the film with an audience and, uh, it was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. It was really, I mean, people were yelling, screaming, talking back to the characters on the screen. It was just, uh, it was wild. Hello, and welcome to this very special Last of the Action Heroes Podcast Network episode. And uh, I'm going to bring on my co-host for this episode, who is the founder of the network. He is the host of the Going the Distance, the Rocky Series podcast, the One More Round uh, a further exploration of the Rocky series, the great new Rambo podcast, the uh, It's a Long Road, along with a bunch of podcasts that aren't here on the network that I'm sure we'll talk about. It's Ryan Rebalkin. Ryan, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. You know what's funny? I am so excited that you are actually hosting the first Last of the Action Heroes podcast show that I'm not hosting. Like you took charge of this, and I'm really thankful. That was actually my when I created the Last of the Action Heroes podcast network when I had the idea that I want to invite accomplished, well-spoken, fun hosts, which everyone is of these shows. My, my hope was, is that people would take the mantle of their fandom of other movies and invite each other on. So the guy from Bruce Wills would have the guys from Arnold and Rocky minute would have a sly cat. Like I wanted the, like what you and Doug and I have done. I wanted that with the other host. So I'm still going to make that plug. So when these guys listen, you guys are listening to this episode. I still my plug and hope that we all kind of collaborate and take it on ourselves to say, Hey, I want to do, um, I don't know, uh, lone, lone wolf McQuaid. It's a movie that I enjoy. I'm going to invite Doug. You know, so that's kind of how I envision it. So I want to make that clear to those hosts that are listening. That's how I envision this. So Craig, thank you sure. for taking that mantle on this special episode that we're doing on Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah. And and I got to say that um, this was an episode I felt we really needed to do because Bruce Willis is part of our network. There's a show dedicated on our network. And we'll get into this in a minute, but I also think he's a part, a big part of modern day action movies, but um, I'm sure anybody listening here knows that Bruce Willis recently announced through his family that he was retiring from acting due to an illness that has basically impacted his ability to do his job that he loves so much. Yeah. Um, and I'm not the biggest Bruce Willis fan in the world, Ryan. I appreciate his movies. I have a couple of favorites, but man, this news, it hit me really, really hard, man. And it, it, it weighed on my mind for a, a couple of days. And that's why I reached out to everybody to, to kind of see if we could just all share the positive stuff that we we've enjoyed uh, over the like almost 40 year career. The dudes had. Yeah. It's crazy. Again. Yeah. Great, great idea. And I, I think it's really awesome that you took this on and cause I don't think I would have thought of it. So thank you. And you're right. Bruce uh, Willis has, he's entertained me for decades and I'm kind of like you. I've never, I've never gone to see a movie because Bruce Willis is in it, but I've gone to movies and have enjoyed them immensely that Bruce Willis is in. And I don't know how that works in the algorithm of fandom, <laughs> but I've never, or put it this way, I've never avoided a movie because Bruce is in it. So there, cause there's some actors I just don't want to watch or actresses. I don't want to like, Oh, I can't stand that person. So I don't want to see them for an hour and a half. I've got better things to do with my time. Bruce is always someone when they're on screen, you know, we'll talk about his later years here, but throughout the heyday, you know, from eighties to, to the early two thousands. Oh, Bruce is in it. Great. Like even a show like the Bruce Wells guys, they did the, the whole nine yards. Now, I may have seen that movie more because I kind of dug friends at the time a lot. And I wanted to see Matthew Perry in a uh, comedy role outside of friends. And I enjoy Matthew Perry's comedy style. I actually kind of like his comedy style and his rhythms and Oh, Bruce Willis happens to be into comedy with him. Okay. That's fun. Uh, Pulp Fiction. Of course you could almost argue it's probably one of the best movies Bruce Willis has ever been in. And <laughs> it's Pulp Fiction with the Quentin Tarantino. 
Uh, but again, I didn't see it because of Bruce. I actually saw that movie. I talked about it on your Jack Rat- Rabbit Slim show. I saw Pulp Fiction because I'm a huge fan of Uma Thurman. I have a huge crush on her. And when I was 18, yeah. she was in this movie you know, looking all cute with that Bobby haircut and whatever. And she's reading that comic book on the bed. I had no idea what it was about. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I saw it because of Uma. So again, every Bruce film I've seen, uh, Six Sense, another incredible film. But I saw it because of the buzz at the time, 1999. Everyone was talking about the big ending, the big ending. And that's, oh, I got to see this movie before I get it spoiled. So I went to go see this movie because of the big ending. So again, Bruce has somehow attached himself, cleverly so, or either his agent or whoever's reading his scripts. He's attached himself to some incredibly successful, fun movies. Yeah, and we'll get a little into the filmography um, in a bit. But I think first we'll just throw to Josh and Kendrick from the Where There's a Willis there's a way podcast and uh, get their thoughts on, on Bruce as he's made this announcement. Awesome. Hello, this is Kendrick Martin. And this is Josh Carter. And we host the world renowned podcast where there's a Willis, there's a way we're here today to talk about Bruce Willis, which is what we talk about normally, but we're doing a little special tribute just for our man. Our, our sweet, Q Q ball of a boy, Bruce Willis. Our sweet Q ball of a boy, Bruno himself. The the Bruno. <laughs> uh so our podcast has covered 31 movies, I think. We started if you haven't been listening, um we started se- sequentially with his first movie, uh Blind Date and worked forward to the year we're currently in the year 2000, the last episode we recorded was the kid uh and yeah we're just gonna kind of like talk through his career up until now any other comments we can make um yeah josh i don't know if you have any other lead-in notes you want to let people know about or no i'm i'm sure that others in the the cast so far i've already gone over kind of what's going on but basically uh if you skipped around just to get to our bit. Um, As you probably have heard, Bruce Willis is retiring from acting. He has several more movies coming out in this year, kind of continuing along with the segment of movies that he was making um, where they're super low budget, uh, just trying to get, get you to see Bruce Willis on the front and be like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a 50 year old dad. I watched Bruce Willis as a kid. I should get this. Um, so they're, uh, not, not much of something, but we are still in the genuine era of his career in our podcast. And so we kind of wanted to shout out some of the different movies that we've liked and maybe talk through and reminisce a little bit and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it's really easy now to look at Bruce Willis over the last 20 years and see him as kind of a, you know, classic Hollywood action hero, type um playing a lot of his stereotyped roles but i think and josh and i have talked about this a lot in our podcast about how surprised we are at the different um twists to his career and kind of how he really challenged himself he specifically seeked out um actors and directors and other filmmakers that he wanted to work with and oftentimes like took a pay cut to work with them uh So seeing him kind of in his career prime, it's been really neat how he's challenged himself. And, you know, as a person have a, has a deep career history that can be often overlooked if you just kind of think of him as the guy who did die hard. So Mm -hmm. yeah, let's just kind of run through a couple of these. So the first two we did were, um, kind of connected because they were both, Blake Edwards films. So sunset uh, and blind date were his first two movies. Mm -hmm. And Josh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, you didn't really particularly like either of these. I didn't, I didn't like either of them. And I remember the, the reason that I didn't like sunset is that it's kind of just like not as good as it should be the entire time. But blind date, I remember liking the end like 30 minutes because they go to like a weird, transition from like a one bad night storyline to like at this guy's house and there's like a wedding that's going on and it's very like it's a mad 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 world about everything and so t- 
tons of shenanigans happen. I remember liking that part, but yeah, it's uh it's interesting seeing especially where he's come from and everything cuz he was playing like a rom-com dude essentially back then. He wasn't even into the action stuff at all. Um and that's like very in line with what he was doing on TV at the time cuz he was in the Moonlighting series obviously. So Yeah, I guess I guess yeah. yeah, we skipped over the fact that he was so well known for Moonlighting and mm-hmm. Moonlighting unfortunately is kind of hard show to um watch now. We were yeah. able to get a hold of some DVDs and watch uh some episodes from some some of the seasons, but um you know, that was a multi-season show. Really broke a lot of uh, the mold when it comes to, um, TV, especially in the eighties. So mm-hmm. it was kind of fascinating to kind of see how they were, uh, you know, well before the streaming era and well before the internet were writing episodes up until, you know, minutes before they recorded and they were recorded like very briefly before they aired. And so it was like super back to back to back. Um, and, really interesting show. I, um, you know, always hope that that show can somehow find a, a platform that it can be seen easier. Your Hulu or something. Um, so maybe with the news of Bruce Willis retiring, there'll be someone who kind of buys the rights and can stream it. I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know who owns the rights right now, but yeah. So yeah. his, his career was definitely comedic kind of like romantic lead. Um, and so Sunset and Blind Date were both leaning into that comedy pretty heavily. Yeah. I remember Blind Date really liking the one joke where that guy continues to drive through, uh, walls oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and is always driving into like ridiculous like flower and factories. Stuff like <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, dish soap or flour and he just like hits the wall and just gets covered in whatever. I thought, obviously, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that gag just really worked on me, but it did. Yeah. Um, okay. Then, then next, uh, is Die Hard, little known indie film. Yeah. Uh, super small, which I think is German for the hard. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> that sounds right. Um, is that East German or West German for mm, the hard? Cause at that yeah. point there were still two Germanies, right? Fair, fair. They yeah. spoke the same German though. Oh, they did. <laughs> Damn. I got to brush up in my linguistics class, I guess from. 1988, 1989, yeah. or whenever that came um, out. <laughs> you know, everybody, people have written novels about Die Hard in yeah. the amount of, in the amount of work. I, I don't know if we can really add much more to it. Um, I have seen it, so I've seen it a couple times since we recorded this episode, which wasn't even that long ago, but you know, it still holds up. It's a great movie. It's fun to watch at Christmas time with the kind of like, uh, menacing, um, uh, Christmas Carol that's like playing in the background. And yep. then, uh, we, we joke about this in our review, but at the end, it's like they kill the bad guy <laughs> and then they're just like, whew, so glad we finally made it out. And then this immediately cuts to have a holly jolly Christmas. <laughs> it's like <laughs> such a tonal shock to the system. <laughs> oh man. That, that, that movie is great though. It's so good. And that really, was a a big one for Bruce Willis because he, I don't think he was like anywhere near the top of the casting choices for that role. Like they wanted the Stallone or the Schwarzenegger, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And then they got Bruce Willis and they're like, well, I guess we'll see. And then he knocked it out of the park. And then that kind of like opened up this avenue of action movies, which as we see over the coming years, he really, we see a pattern of him doing action movies um, and then try and interesting things within those action movies after a bit and then alternating those with like, like you were saying, the movies that he really wanted to do with these auteur directors or, um, these other famous actors and stuff like that. Like he did a movie later on, we'll get to it with a uh, Paul Newman just because he wanted to work with Paul Newman. That those are the sorts of things that like Bruce Willis did. And I think that that gets overlooked a lot when you look at Bruce Willis. It's really easy to just think of him as like the, the diehard striking distance, last boy scout actor and forget about kind of all these other ones that he's done that are, um, that are more unique and more fun. So 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and that takes us to our next movie, number four, In Country, Mm -hmm. which, um, it remains in my top 10 Bruce Willis movies. And, same here. Uh, it's one I've kind of been, I've been thinking a lot about and I've wanted to revisit. And, um, it's one that you almost never hear anyone talk about. Uh, it, yeah. uh, it, it's where I think is we as kind of doing this podcast really started to realize he goes from comedic role to action role to serious emotional role back to back to back to back. And, uh, isn't afraid to kind of take chances and try different things and stretch himself as an actor. So yeah, totally, um, totally agree. Yeah. And then after that, he does a Josh is one of Josh's movie? favorite movies. Yeah. <laughs> He's in a look who's talking, which I think is a fine idea of a movie <laughs> that has this gimmick that is, pretty much insufferable um most of the time but i I like kind of the core story with uh john travolta and uh what the fuck is her name i should know this uh shoot i mispronounced her name kirstie alley yes kirstie alley yeah um yeah and that movie is uh it's it's fine (laughs) it's fine if you haven't yeah i think like as a rom-com like the 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 rom com elements aren't as bad as I was expecting, mm-hmm. but the talking baby uh wears a little thin. Yeah. Um but all in all it's not I I mean, I'm not gonna watch it again, but it wasn't as bad. The sequel, which we'll get to in a minute, way worse. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of worse sequels, next movie that he did was Die Hard Two. Um really soon after Die Hard, like Literally two years after Die Hard, Die Hard 2 comes out, and it's worse in basically every way than the first movie. <laughs> but even though it's worse, it's not, I mean, not as terrible as some of these other movies were here yeah. coming up. Um, yeah. I think a lot of times when people think about the great Die Hards, they think about the original and then Die Hard 3. Yeah. Um, are kind of what people's favorites tend to be. Um, Die Hard 2 is definitely worse than both of those, but it still has its interesting moments. I think... Uh, the twist at the end, um, where you kind of find out like who's been behind the whole thing and who's been, um, how, how things are working. Oh yeah. Um, I found kind of interesting and like, I wasn't expecting it all. So, um, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Then we got Luke who's talking to, which we just said worse than Luke who's talking in every way possible. Yep. Um, the romance subplot is terrible. The talking babies are terrible. Uh, yeah, just yeah, it's did not so hard to watch. Did not particularly care for. <clears throat> and then, um, he does a, a series of dramatic roles. Now, the first one of these, Bonfire of the Vanities. Um, this movie is is interesting because it spawned. Um, even though Bruce Willis's role isn't huge in this movie, uh, this movie spawned a lot of, uh, talk just in general about the state of things in Hollywood because, uh, so much of this movie, um, crashed and burned. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm just, I just looked it up. The budget was 47 million and its box office was 15 million. Um, <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> and it is miscast and mis built in every possible way. Tom Hanks tries to play this kind of scumbag, um, you know, greed is good type, uh, character. And that's just not possible for Tom Hanks. He's not, he mm-hmm. cannot do it. Um, and Bruce Willis plays this, kind of down on his luck journalist who somehow lucks his way into a case that I think, yeah, this movie tried to be a farce. It didn't pull it off as a farce and it was just mm-hmm. a confusing, poorly represented 
movie in all ways. Um, and there's like I, weird racial elements to this movie yeah. too. The, yeah. Just, it's, uh, I will it's say rough. this though, before we move on, the opening one or one shot scene is pretty cool. Very Absolutely neat. amazing. Bruce Willis sits on like a golf cart and they ride and the camera follows him as he sits on the back and like eats food and navigates this complicated crowd and, um, super cool. Uh, yeah. next up is mortal thoughts. And I think this is the first movie where Bruce Willis plays, uh, the villain. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken in this movie, he is kind of the abusive husband to, is it Demi Moore's character? Is this where they meet? Um, no, he did this movie when they were married. Um, she like, it was a passion project kind of for her. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I remember correctly. Yeah. So yeah, he plays, uh, kind of an abusive person in their lives and then dies. And then the movie kind of follows the kind of her, um, kind of talking to the investigator on like how this happened. Um, kind mm-hmm. of like we're playing it out, but I just thought the like filmmaking was kind of confusing and, um, yeah. So, yeah, but I will say that you can start to see Bruce Willis start to kind of get get more comfortable with his acting chops and stuff in those movies. Like he's really stretching himself a lot. It doesn't work in the Bonfire of the Vanities, but in Mortal Thoughts, I was like, all right, I'm starting to get what you're what you're going for, and I think that I think you're not like necessarily knocking it out of the park. But I thought it was a a pretty decent performance from him. Up next. A hidden gem that uh, Josh and I both love. Yeah. Hudson Hawk. Yeah. Would we have both loved this as much if we hadn't just watched Look Who's Talking To, Bonfire of <laughs> the Vanities, and Mortal Thoughts? <laughs> Who's to say? Um, Probably. <laughs> but, yeah. We've, yeah. Uh, you know, I've said this a lot, but I don't tend to watch the uh, – I don't, like, look up the plot summary to any of these movies beforehand. I just, yep. you know, we have them picked out. We're going to watch them. Uh, we just dive in and, uh, I, because of that, I had no idea what Hudson Hawk was going to be about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it starts fairly straightforward. He's in prison. He's released on parole. He kind of runs into his old gang. You know, we, this is our, our 10th movie we've watched. So I have kind of an idea of like Bruce Willis's cadence and I'm like, okay, I figure out where this is going to go. And it just goes, off the rails. Yep. Uh, you know, in, in multiple ways. Um, not a movie you can take seriously. Definitely. It falls in that weird kind of silly, but not, it, I don't think it's really campy. It's just silly. Yeah. And, uh, the whole cast is funny. It definitely kind of drags on and the plot gets a little, um, confusing at the end, but, um, definitely just like, you know, the kind of movie you get together with your buddies and laugh about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was my most watched movie last year was Hudson Hawk. I think I watched it. Wow. Times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's great though. It's so fun. <laughs> and then we get another stinker, Billy Bathgate. Although to his credit, he's hardly in this movie. Billy yeah. Bathgate is kind of a 1920s gangster movie about uh, some bootleggers or or I don't know what I don't know if they're just like you know regular gangsters in the kind of during the Prohibition era or what, but um, yeah, I don't really have much to say there. It was not not worth it. <laughs> yeah, not worth it. Um, next, we jumped forward to uh, modern times and watched his new release, Cosmic Sin, uh, which if you're not familiar, um, and in the last four or five years, Bruce Willis has um, started just outputting like a lot of uh, kind of straight to DVD movies. And oftentimes he has a really small role and he's the budget is mainly just paying for him to show up and then they put him on the marketing. Um, so this is definitely one of those. Uh, it had some interesting sci-fi elements, but for the most part, uh, pretty forgettable. Yep. Totally. 
Uh, up next, Last Boy Scout. Um, uh, here's where we kind of start to see the hints of Bruce Willis starting to, to find his like action star career. Mm-hmm. He's basically, um, you know, they're, uh, there's shootouts, they're solving mysteries, they're hanging out at bars, there's helicopter scenes, particularly one at the end. And, uh, just that classic 90s, um, action movie stuff, which, uh, now is what we know him for, but here is kind of like what he's really getting started. Yeah. Um, feeling that roll out. Oh, yeah. For sure. Uh, up next, Death Becomes Here. This is another treat. It's a Robert Zemeckis movie that I didn't really know anything about going into. But the cover of this movie has Bruce Willis uh, sticking his hand through Goldie Hawn's. It's him standing next to Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn. And he's sticking his hand through one of their chests. Uh, like there's a hole in her body and he's sticking his hand through it. And then the other uh, person is standing there with her head on backwards. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting, you know, I wonder what the allegory that they're trying to tell you with this, uh, <laughs> you know, cover art here. Um, no, it's not an allegory. It's legitimately what happens in this movie. <laughs> movie is bonkers. It is bananas. And I've softened on it over time. I didn't love it when I first watched it, but the more I think about it, the more I'm like, maybe that movie is kind of a bit of a hidden gem, but you definitely have to like camp in order to like that movie, I think. And um, Bruce Willis's role in that movie is not even that big. Uh, no. And he plays like a really, really weird role for Willis where he's just like there to be the freak out guy, but he's playing like, a straight man loser character who's just there to like show how bonkers everything else is around him. And he plays it really soft and subdued and it's really funny. Yeah. He's kind of like the passive husband character. Yep. And these other two, uh, gals are just totally running the show. Um, I thought the comedy, the comedy worked for me. I was just kind of like, you know, in shock and awe most of the time. Yep. Yep. Uh, up next is Striking Distance. Um, another movie that I didn't really care for, although it's one that people kind of bring up every now and then as, um, like a, you know, a Bruce Willis movie to, re- to recall. I mm. don't really have any fond memory of this movie. I don't know. How, what about you? I only remember Bruce Willis in like 70s looking shorts. <laughs> and that's like the only thing that I remember about this movie. I swear to God. I <laughs> like, he spends a lot of time in boats. Yep. Yep. And there's like a, a fake body that gets planted in the river at one point to like throw people off the trail. I don't know. It has that one actor though. That's really, really scummy to, to, he plays this really scummy sort of character all the time. What is his name? Um, he's great at playing this character. Uh, Brian James. Brian James is pretty funny in that movie. That's Brian with an O if you're trying to look him up. <laughs> Brian with an O. Brian. <laughs> Brian James. Oh. Byron? Uh, but the R's? Oh. That is spelled weird. You, uh, <laughs> this guy, I know him best from a movie we've yet to bring up, but, uh, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so moving on. Yeah, next up was uh, Pulp Fiction, um, which I I think that people have done a lot of evaluating of Quentin Tarantino and his the way that he writes about black people, the way that he writes black people. I'm not really crazy on it. I do think that that movie is pretty great, despite the problems that are that abound with Quentin Tarantino. Um, but that movie is pretty solid and Bruce Willis is just great in the, in it too. (laughs) That was another one of his, like he took a pay cut for the movie because he wanted to do it. And I think it really paid off for him. Yeah. This movie, you know, again, 
tomes have been written about this movie. Um, don't need to expound much into it, but, uh, it was interesting finding out Bruce Willis really wanted to work with, um, Quentin Tarantino and, um, really enjoyed working with him. Up next is North. Mm-hmm. Now this movie I started watching and I was like, Oh, this is really funny and clever and I'm enjoying this. But, uh, the end just really took a nosedive for me, but I don't think it did that for you. Right, Josh? Yeah. I, uh, I thought that it was racist as fuck, but the, um, the end of the movie, I didn't know how they could have ended it any other way. <laughs> like it, they wrote themselves into a, a fucking corner with that movie. <laughs> Yeah, so essentially the plot of this movie, if you're unfamiliar, Elijah Wood is a kid named North who is so popular and so smart and so, so well loved that he's just so bored at school and he can't figure out what to do with his life. But his parents are, um, I'm blanking on their real names. They're George Costanza and Elaine Bennett from Seinfeld. Uh, gosh. Do they have real names or those not their real names? Julia Louis Dreyfus and uh La 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 <laughs> Josh, you're supposed to be helping me out here. I don't I haven't watched Seinfeld really much at all, so <laughs> <sighs> let's see. What is what does IMDB tell me? Jason Alexander? Yes, Jason Alexander. Man. Yep. Um, you did it. I'm gonna blame my uh dad brain on that one. <laughs> sleep sleep deprivation. Um yeah, so they play his parents and they don't care anything about him. So he decides to interview other parents around the world and they look at the the uh you know the credentials on this kid and they're like and you know he's I don't know, middle school. Mm-hmm. Uh and they're just like absolutely. Yeah, let's get him. So he just travels the world to different families being interviewed and deciding if he wants to live with them. Uh, so that is about that, you know, leads to what you would expect. Um, but there are some pretty funny moments, including Reba McIntyre driving like a limousine, the size of three <laughs> limousines, uh, cause and it's singing a song about Texas. Yep. Uh, so that yep. part was pretty good. Uh, next color of night. Now this movie, I, uh, again, we see a little bit different side of him. He plays, it's kind of, um, a, like, uh, uh, I don't know. What would you, what would you like? A, it's not like just a romance or it's like an erotic thriller. I think. Yeah. I guess erotic thing. thriller, which is a, a genre of movie that has disappeared pretty much. Yeah. Um, but I thought this movie was pretty good and I was entertained and, uh, we get to see a naked Bruce Willis in a swimming pool. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I wish that this movie was better. They make a really big deal about him being colorblind when it's convenient. And then they forget about it when it was cool (laughs) to remember that. Um, but yeah, that movie is, the movie's all right. (laughs) Uh, yeah. Uh, following that is nobody's fool. This is the movie Josh mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, with John Newman and Paul Newman. What's, Oh, Paul Newman. Yeah. What did I say? John Newman. Yeah. Who's John Newman? I don't know. Friend of yours. I'm assuming. Um, man, Paul Newman and Gary Oldman should get together and make a movie. Uh, unfortunately, I think Paul Newman is dead. Um, he needs so... some, we need a new version of him. <laughs> Paul New Newman. Yeah, there you go. Paul this is really Newest going off man. the rails here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, this is kind of like a family holiday drama set in somewhere in uh massachusetts i think I like yeah Christmas somewhere time. on the east coast and um paul newman uh is kind of taking care of people in this town and um yeah um but but like josh mentioned earlier uh, bruce willis really wanted to work with him so mm-hmm. 
again, he kind of negotiated his way into this movie for that, for that reason. Yeah. Uh, up next is Die Hard with a Vengeance, the third Die Hard. Now, um, this one, the plot made even less sense. Now, if you're a Die Hard watcher, you know that the plot never makes any sense. Mm-mm. But, uh, this one even less so. And, but, um, I still like it for the fact that it gave us that great scene with Samuel Jackson and Bruce Willis in a fountain trying to measure the correct number of ounces to defuse <laughs> a bomb. <laughs> and, and basically they just yada, yada, yada their way through the end. Yep. <laughs> They're like, uh, this, that, oh, okay, I guess we're done. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of those movies where it's like, and then this happens like as if it's like a 10 year old playing with toys. And then this dad is ferociously writing it down to become the outline of the the movie. Cause it just, it starts out pretty promising and then it just gets to be bonkers. And the bonker stuff is thankfully really fun to watch. Cause it's directed by John McTiernan. Um, but it, it's, it's a wild ride. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, following that is 12 monkeys, which is probably my favorite Bruce Willis movie. Mm -hmm. Um, it is, I think I said this when we recorded the episode, but this movie could be an entire film studies class. Like there's so many different layers to analyze here with the, the different performances, the different visual choices, the storytelling technique. Brad Pitt's character, Bruce Willis's character. Um, yeah, just a ton there. So I love this movie. I'm glad we got to talk about it. Yeah. Same here. Um, that, next, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say up next is, uh, what, did you have more to say about 12 monkeys? Nope. Nope. Okay. Up next was, uh, Last Man Standing. And that movie is, based on kind of like a samurai esque story where like samurai comes to save the town sort of a thing. And it's fine. Um, he, the movie looks and sounds way cooler than anything that's actually in the movie. And if you start watching it and you're like, I don't think I like this movie. You're not going to like mm-hmm. this movie because <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's 100% vibes, 0% everything else. Um, but it's kind of like a gangster meets a Western movie, um, kind of set in that time frame where like people would drive into like these towns and go into the saloon, but you'd be carrying a Tommy gun instead of like a, a little six shot revolver or whatever. So it's interesting, but not super notable beyond, um, actually not super notable in any way. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on a Kurosawa movie, which I keep meaning to watch, but yeah, essentially, um, Bruce Willis's character kind of shows up and uh, kind of convinces the two rival gangs in this town to fight each other. And then he's able to, you know, work his magic and get them to kind of kill each other. And then he's, you know, the last yeah. man standing. Um, then we did kind of a double feature of two small of two movies where he had a really small role um, Four rooms and the player. So four rooms is a quint is, is a movie with four different uh, segments and mm-hmm. each segment's directed by a different director. And the final segment is the Quentin Tarantino segment and Bruce Willis is in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen a lot of people say this is one of their favorite Bruce Willis performances, which I find interesting because it's such a small role. Yeah. Yeah. He's barely in that movie. And the, the nice thing to see is that he's still kind of got like his, his chops there. Cause that Quentin Tarantino scene is almost entirely one take. Um, and then, so you have to be like on point with everything and yeah, he did a good job with it. It's not my favorite segment of the movie, but no, yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, and the player, I honestly don't remember. Does he just have a walk on? Oh no, he's at the end of the movie. Yeah. He's at the end of the movie. He plays himself parodying himself, which is like the first, probably the first major one of these where he kind of plays a parody of the sort of stuff that he had been doing at that point. 
Yeah. And I love the player. Yeah. The player was a fun movie. Yeah. Um, you liked it, I think, a bit more than me, but I still had fun with it. Um, yeah. But then the next movie we talk about, I loved a lot more than you. We're talking about the fifth element. Yep. Uh, I don't, I cannot tell you why I love this movie so much, but this movie <laughs> is 100% my jam. <laughs> Wacky, unexplained science fiction. Uh, Gary Oldman just being ridiculously evil. Yep. Uh, you know, cruise ships in space and trash piles and weird aliens. And it's just, I'm here for it all. <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet, expect all the effects to look like Dr. Like all of the practical effects look like Dr. Who, but like the old Dr. Who, and you'll be pretty much right at home. It yes. is, it is beyond cheesy. It, circles back to being good <laughs> like <laughs> yes i know it's bizarre i love this movie so much um <laughs> then we covered kind of as a combo package uh some of his voiceover work so he he did a voiceover character for the um cartoon movie beavis and butthead which josh and i both hated uh <laughs> we talk about this a lot in that episode but i think beavis and butthead really hits that gen X vibe that neither Josh and I are. If I found, you know, the entire movie insufferable and, uh, really had nothing positive to say. We also yep. talked about Bruno, the kid, which is a animated TV show where, um, Bruce Willis plays the titular Bruno. Who's like a super smart kid who the CIA has hired, um, not realizing he's a kid and he like goes on spy missions all the time, which is fun. But um, very low budget, very like every episode is almost the same plot and a lot of the same animations reused. Um, but I think it's all on YouTube or most of it's on YouTube. And I still still fun to watch a few episodes. Yeah. Uh, up next, we have The Jackal. Um, another movie where Bruce Willis gets to play the bad guy, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, he gets to play the bad guy. And he was originally not cast as that, but he took it the movie on the condition that he could play the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like seeing these movies where he plays the bad guy because, um, he, uh, I think gets to kind of stretch himself a little more. I think mm -hmm. he was, um, kind of too easily typecast as this kind of, you know, last boy scout America hero type. Um, but to see him play the bad guy, I thought it was really fun. The scene with, um, Jack Black, right? That was this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where he's like testing guns and Jack Black is kind of this just complete doofus. And, uh, there's just a lot of wacky stuff in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. That movie is uh bizarre. It's also like one of the last movies that Sidney Poitier was in. Um, notable for that. And also in one Bruce Willis is kind of playing this like, uh, master of disguises sort of character. And it's really fun to see him do that. But the rest of the movie around him is bad. And Richard Gere is in it and he oh, yeah. has his own story and he has this terrible Irish accent. And it's it's a hard movie to watch. It's not a hidden gem, but Bruce Willis does a good job in it. Uh, Up next, Mercury Rising. So it's not a hidden gem. Bruce Willis does a good job in it and it's pretty unwatchable. <laughs> If I'm if I'm being honest, I don't remember the plot at all to Mercury Rising. It, it has some me? kid that can solve puzzles oh, yes. and oh God, yes. that movie. Okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> they like put a puzzle in a in a back of a magazine and he solves it somehow. Okay. Yep. Moving on. Yep. Armageddon. Uh you Maybe know, not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they they, uh, they don't know nothing about drilling. They so don't they know nothing about drilling. <laughs> they need, this is probably one of my favorite episodes we've ever recorded. Oh, I yeah. go back and listen to this and I just cry laughing. <laughs> um, we, you know, are just in shock and awe that this movie got made. <laughs> and both of us had had a few drinks when we were recording it too. And we were recording it in person. And so the, the chemistry is there and it's, it's a, 
a jacked up time and I was like afraid that I was going to be the only person that disliked this and Kendrick was going to love it because it's a really well liked movie. But I, I was so glad that we were both just shitting on that movie the entire time. <laughs> yeah. What a, yeah. <laughs> what a movie. The ending is just so bananas with the like, the the rock you know out to get them so sorry. oh yeah <laughs> uh okay moving on we're almost done the siege the siege uh, another movie i don't quite remember that was the one that was 9 11 before 9 11 happened with oh like, and he plays like the army general right yeah yeah he's in okay. it like towards the end of the movie and yeah. he's like trying to set up martial law and Bruce Willis isn't even that good in this movie. He just kind of plays like a, a gruffy general. And then every single Hollywood person was like, what if he's our gruffy general from now yeah. on? I, um, yeah, I couldn't tell you really much about this movie. It really just didn't have much of a hold on me. Nope. Um, after that, the story of us. Now, this was another movie where he broke away from kind of the action trend he had been on to do more romantic, slower movie. Mm-hmm. Um, to work Rob with Reiner. a specific director. Yeah, exactly. Rob Reiner comedy. Oh, I forgot. I didn't realize that he wanted to work specifically with Rob Reiner, but yeah, I, I believe that that's sense. why he took it. Um, I didn't particularly love this movie, mm-hmm. but, uh, I just mainly because I thought the, um, the chemistry and the, the, characters and it didn't really work for me but i thought that uh um some of the comedy parts were good yeah oh i'm actually i'm actually wrong it's he didn't want to work with rob reiner specifically but he had already worked with rob reiner at this point because north was directed by rob reiner gotcha yeah yeah um yeah that movie was fine it bruce willis is fine in it um the interesting thing is that it's a movie about like divorce and both Bruce Willis and Michelle Pfeiffer were going through divorces at the time. And the movie looks like they're both in pain when you're watching it. (laughs) And that's kind of rough. Um, that's like taking method acting to a whole new level by accident. So (laughs) makes me feel sad for them. Uh, and then wrapping up our first season, um, was the sixth sense. So this movie also probably one of his, most well-known movies. First time working with M night Shyamalan, he will go on to work with him a handful of times after this. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I really love this movie. This movie really holds up. Um, I thought, you know, the plot was super interesting. The, the twists were super interesting and really, it all worked for me. I had already seen it before. It was your first time watching it when we watched it, right, Josh? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it worked. You liked it for work for you. Oh yeah. I loved it. And the movie just did gangbusters. Like it, it had a budget of 40 million and then it made back 672 million. So it just did tremendously. And I think Bruce will assign some sort of deal where he gets like, uh, like lower, lower pay upfront and then good residuals. And he's just gotten so much money from this movie over the years. And he does a really good performance in it. And he like, uh, what's the kid's name? Joel, Joel Oz, Osment. Yeah, Joel Osment. Yeah, he's also just great in it. It's hard to say more that about this movie than what's already been said. Kind of like with those other movies, but yeah, I really liked watching it. It was it was really enjoyable. Um, yeah, I'm excited to do Unbreakable. Um, you know, the next M Night Shyamalan movie. Yeah. Um, I I think well, it'll be fun to talk about. Uh, and then so then we have the whole nine yards, mm-hmm. which we just recently watched. Um, I think it's one of my favorite, uh, types of roles for Bruce Willis to play. He plays kind of the anti-hero. He's not really the protagonist and he's not really the bad guy, but he's, he kind of throws the monkey wrench into the plans. He can play, uh, swarmy. He can be menacing. He can crack jokes. He can do gunslinging, gun shooting, all that kind of stuff. I thought that role kind of played entirely to his strengths. Oh yeah, totally. Totally agree. And then to wrap this up, a movie that I didn't particularly think played to his strengths, The Kid. Yep. A movie that he did because he wanted his kids to be able to watch him in something modern that's for a family. And it's bad. And don't watch it. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's a real bummer. Yeah. But I, even yep. if you're a kid, don't watch the kid. Yeah, <laughs> especially if you're a kid, don't watch the kid. That'll shape you. When you're a kid, you don't know what's good and what's bad, and that'll be like your favorite movie, and you'll have to admit that to yourself as an adult, and that'll be terrible. Yeah, that'll so. be like a truth, two truths and a dare, yeah. or, or a lie or whatever, and you'll be like, I like the movie The Kid, and everybody like, lie. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, nothing good's so, going to come of that. Uh, I know this is running kind of long, but, um, yeah, it's been nice revisiting some of these. Some of these are, you know, I couldn't remember the plot if it hit me in the plot face, but yep. otherwise, so, you know, some of these classics that I'm really glad I got to watch. Oh yeah. Same here. And I think that we haven't really talked about it much, but like one of my favorite things about Bruce Willis, other than the types of things that he took on the types of roles and stuff like that, but in his movies, he does probably the best like freak out moment. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. And it, like he has great freak out moments where he just like starts losing it. If you listen to any of our uh, podcasts in our intro, we have this moment where he's just losing it over something. I think it's in cop out. We haven't gotten to the movie yet, wherever he has that line yet <laughs> in it. And it's, it's great. And Die Hard, he's got that whole like, does yeah. it look like I wanted a pizza or whatever? Yeah. And he's yeah. just screaming at the lady. Yeah, it's great. He's he's known for the freak out moments. And Pulp Fiction, he is a great freak out moment. So I think that he is one of the best Hollywood freak out errs of of his time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a A list freak outer. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh so yep. Buddy Bruce. It's been uh, great watching your movies. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you we, for all the, the good performances uh, out there. And um, I'm so glad that we got a chance to go through and kind of dive into these. Cause like Kendrick and I have said, we hadn't seen most of these movies before and, yeah. and it's been a, it's been a real treat. And I don't think I ever would have either. No, like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I had to rent the last stand. Would I have watched that movie? <laughs> otherwise? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, thank you. And if you guys want to follow uh either of us, you can find uh you can find me on Twitter at at I have, to, have to remember what? <laughs> Joshing Carter? At Joshing Carter. Yep. I had to remember what my Twitter handle was. I'm so glad that you remembered what it was though. <laughs> yeah, that uh that's what I'm here for. And mine is K Martinix. That's K M A R T I N I X. Or you can follow our podcast on Twitter at Willisway Pod. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everybody. All right. So that was Josh and Kendrick and uh their thoughts on on Bruce and uh They've had a whole podcast dedicated to him and they're not stopping it. So uh, uh, we've got that uh, to look forward to. Um, I want to say thanks to the, uh, where there's a will, there's a way guys uh, there. They were the first, they were the first show, I believe, if not the second, like it was either him or uh, I must break this podcast with Sean Malloy. So it was one of the two, but the Bruce Willis guys were the first ones who didn't, they didn't know me from Adam is what I'm getting at who agreed to come on the network totally out of blind faith. So I also want to thank those guys. Hey guys, thanks for uh, taking a chance on the network and uh, sharing your show with us. Cause I know there are people from my shows and uh, Craig and Doug shows that definitely are now listening to your shows. And that was the whole idea that the, the cross pollination has uh, been very, uh, very beneficial to both, uh, both podcasts. And, uh, yeah, they do a great job. They do a great job breaking down Bruce Willis. It's kind of fun because they're a little bit younger than me and you, I think. And so a lot of these films are actually watching for the first time. So it's kind of fun to to listen to of uh, their voice on these films. A lot, of, a lot of Bruce's films that they haven't seen before. I'm like I can't believe they haven't seen X, Y, Z, and then they yeah. talk about it. So it's actually you're getting a review and a kind of a reaction to a lot of Bruce's films with these guys. So it's cool, cool to listen to that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I think now's a good time to sort of jump into that filmography you talked about and like the. The, the variations he was able to do. And, and I think that mainly speaks to his versatility as an actor and also not either allowing himself or, or not caring about getting pigeonholed. I mean, he did a bunch of TV work prior to film, um, you know, cameos or, or guest starring appearance. I, I know on like Miami Vice, the Twilight Zone. Um, then in 87, I think he had his, his first big movie role, which was Blind Date, which is right. he's held in pretty high regard by certain fans of that kind of movie. Um, but that next year I think is where his whole world changed. Um, and that's with the movie Die Hard. 
Right. Uh, and I do want to step back and say, we, we can't talk about this without moonlighting also, which was sort of what put him on the map as an actor. Yeah. I was um, old enough. And I think you are too, that I remember Bruce being the moonlighting before anything else. So I definitely know my first introduction to Bruce Willis was the TV actor, Bruce Willis. He was moonlighting. Um, it was a show that my parents watched. So I saw it on TV peripherally and sometimes would sit down and watch it with them. I didn't quite get the adult conversations or yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't that, I wasn't that old or sorry, that young. I guess you could say I, I was, uh, 11. Uh, yeah, I was about a 10 to 11 when that show was in its heyday. So I definitely kind of got, I got the beats, but I could tell even as a young kid that Bruce was charismatic. Yeah. And that he was funny and that he had this charm and swagger and uh, devilishness that he's played to throughout all of his films, but I even recognize it. So when he did die hard in 88, yeah. I re- I was one of those people was like, this guy. Yeah. He's that funny, quirky or not quirky, but that funny, wise cracking character on moonlighting. How is he going to pull off an action film? And that's, so I was a uh, early adapter of Bruce from the TV days. So yeah. when die hard came out, I was a, uh, he's not going to be able to pull this off guy. Absolutely. I thought that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's also one of those rare pivots in a career where you're able to become a bigger movie star than you were as a TV star. I mean, only a handful of people have done it, but for, I think Die Hard is, is a, an important moment in action movies because at the time around that time we had, you know, Predator, whatever stuff, Schwarzenegger, uh, whatever stuff Stallone was doing we had just the start of Steven Seagal. And these were all guys that were sold on their physical abilities. Now, Seagal's a tall guy, but by no means is he physically imposing. But they sold him as having a certain skill set. So Die Hard was sold as an action movie with an everyman. And we've talked about Die Hard on my uh, book screen book book club podcast which is on this feed yeah and all the people that were considered for that role before bruce got it and i really i still think to this day that die hard would not be the movie that everybody knows and loves without bruce willis totally agree and that's something that bruce did by being bruce he brought a a whole new face to action that we like we didn't get from stallone and arnold that you could be almost an everyday man and i guess you could say that natural humor there's some really funny moments in die hard and bruce was able to do that through a lot of his future films uh add some humor and uh jovility that you can't do and then what we also get from his future films is his drama his ability to do drama like bruce is all around he's that actor he can do drama action comedy it's it's crazy no, it, it really is. And, and I've talked about Bruce a lot on, on conversations with Jack Rabbit Slims. I still think to this day, it's an underrated performance because of two reasons. There's a lot of great performances in that movie. You've got John Travolta putting in the performance of his career. Sam Jackson, who is just steals every scene he's in. Right. Uma Thurman. But Bruce's performance in that movie, I think, is really really underappreciated. And and I don't know if if people are going to start to reassess his career now that he's done making films or or whatnot, but um, yeah, I I think just there's lots of little performances like that, that people just don't think about because they go directly to Armageddon or something like that. Um, I should say that Bruce, and I don't, I don't think I actually said this on the episode I was with you on Jack rabbits was his performance in Pulp Fiction is actually Oscar worthy. Uh, I, and I, I went to see it because of Uma, but watching it, you know, of course, as years have gone on, uh, it's boy, Bruce is absolutely amazing in that film. Like I think and it's actually not my favorite Quentin Tarantino film by far. I've talked about that as well, but all of the Bruce storylines, those are great. In fact, I'm not a big fan of the Uma John Travolta storyline as much because I'm not a big fan of drugs and drug overdosing and bleeding from the nose crap. I don't enjoy that. But Bruce, his boxing role and uh, his whole storyline and redemption story, uh, he steals the show in Pulp Fiction, hands down. Yeah, and and and, that, and it's pretty wild that it was in a point in his career where he, where that was you can say a gutsy move, yeah, movie for him to make. Um, and I think that's another thing I've I've appreciated about him is he'll do these weird movies mainly because he just wants to do them. Um, 
I, there was two things I wanted to talk about. Um, and some of this is just conversations I had with people at work, but the main, the, the, the first question, it, it kind of piggybacks off Die Hard, Ryan. Do you think that Die Hard and Bruce Willis as the everyman in that movie kind of created a pivot point in action movies and, and made it possible for like dudes like Keanu Reeves Absolutely. and, um, you know, I mean, even like nobody with Bob Odenkirk, um, you know, it just seems like it, it opened up the doors for other people to sort of get into the action movie realm. I was just curious what your feelings on that were. I uh, wait, no, I totally agree because if you look at it, it came out in 88, you know, five years later, mid nineties, both Sly and Arnold, they are not doing well at the box office. Like the decline, I would say the decline of heavy metal and uh, hair metal and Sly and Arnold at the box office were about the same time. I don't know if there's the changing generations or what it was, but because you have films like 12 Monkeys and uh, uh, those movies are coming in where there just seem to be these smarter type films. And uh, you can't the films like, yeah, like Demolition Man was like this was kind of Sly's last little moment in the 90s type film where that kind of action film went away. And I think Die Hard was like the grunge, yeah, <laughs> the grunge movement of action films. Yeah, that's a good point. And you mentioned 12 Monkeys, which I think is another really, really great performance. And I think it gets overshadowed by the amazing Brad Pitt for performance. Right. But there's a level of, of pain and sorrow in Bruce's uh, performance in 12 Monkeys that uh, I don't think he's achieved in any other movie, possibly Looper. Uh, which might be one of his last great films. Um, but I think 12 Monkeys, it's, it's a challenging film. It's a Terry Gilliam film and most mm-hmm. of his films are challenging. But if there's somebody listening to this that hasn't for any reason seen that movie, if you really want to see Willis at the edge of his sort of going out as far as he can as an actor, I think that's a, a, a great movie to watch. So uh, at work, uh, Ryan, uh, somebody mentioned to me the Look Who's Talking films. And they asked a question that I thought was was pretty interesting. And and I know what my answer was, but do you think Look Who's Talking and, and those other movies are su- as successful as they are without Bruce doing the voice of Mikey? I, I doubt it. You know, I doubt it. I think Die Hard didn't hurt the Look Who's Talking box office. I think just the, the stardom of Bruce... Um, made his voice unique enough that if anyone could pull off this baby voice. Yeah. Well, he wasn't doing a baby voice. He was just doing his own voice. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Right. The voice of the baby. You're right. Of course. Uh, can you believe that movie though? It would cost 8 million to make and it made $300 million. It's just one of those lightning in a bottle moments. But I think that's the thing. Like I, I mean, I, and I can't say it was his choice, but like whosever choice it was to be like, let's just do your voice. We're not going to do you doing a baby voice. Um, and, and I think that really, um, really what sold that movie before we continue, uh, we're going to let mm-hmm. the six degrees of Schwarzenegger guys jump in with their thoughts. Hey, what is up everybody? It is John and Kevin from the six degrees of Schwarzenegger podcast. We hope you are all doing well. We're coming at you with a little bit of a special, a special edition snippet here. First of all, how are you doing, Kevin? I'm, I'm feeling good. <laughs> Some of the guys from the podcast network, they wanted to put together this special team effort, um, which we were happy to oblige. We want to all sort of reflect on our, um, our thoughts on Bruce Willis after hearing his, um, his sad diagnosis from his family. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, my thoughts on Bruce Willis are, I, I feel like even though looking over his entire resume, he's, he had, he didn't do that many action movies like proper action movies i still feel like he's on the mount rushmore of action with with schwarzenegger and stallone yeah i agree completely agree i think i think die hard on its own put him up there and and he just stayed there forever yeah and he had some other some other great ones as well we can mention but um but yeah i i I think of him and and schwarzenegger and stallone and then i don't even know who the fourth guy is i feel like we've had this discussion before maybe it's Maybe Van Mel Damme Gibson, or, maybe yeah. Van Damme, you know, but, but those three, I think are the head and shoulders It's it's interesting that they are like the, the planet Hollywood trio, you know? Right. I think they, they sort of had a kindred existence with each other or they could, they were able to recognize that like they were the trio 
Yeah, especially at that time, that um, mid to late 80s into the early 90s, they definitely were the the guys that were sort of leading that charge. Bruce was like the unlikely guy, right? Totally, yes. He didn't fit the mold. Right. So he, I think that it's because unlike Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger, who were larger than life, uh, you know, on screen and their personalities at least seemed to portray that, that Bruce Willis was like your every man. And that's what made John, you know, roles like John McClane so amazing was that it was just this guy and he didn't look like anything special. And, you know, he, he was already, you know, made his way up through Hollywood and was um, popular for more like comedic turns, uh, exactly. like in the show yeah. Moonlighting and um, known for his like wise crack antics, that sort of thing. And to bring that to Die Hard really made it something even more special. Agree, agree. He was like the counterpoint, right? Yeah. To Schwarzenegger and Stallone. He was like the unlikely uh, hero, The as you said, the everyman, the guy who you could actually relate to. Because, I mean, as, as charismatic as uh, Stallone and Schwarzenegger are, you don't see guys like that walking around. You can't picture yourself in their shoes and... And, you know, Willis seemed more like vulnerable or um, less indestructible than your Rambo or your Commando or whatever, those type roles. And that's an excellent point, too, because, you know, I'm, I'm cycling I'm cycling through his filmography in my head, thinking about like what makes all of the performances in a very varied acting career, doing everything from, you know, like new horror or suspense thriller with M. Night Shyamalan and Sixth Sense to something like Fifth Element, which is completely like one of the best sci-fi movies ever made. Yes. To, you know, like 12 Monkeys. And it's like in everything there is that there's a humanity. There's something that you identify with. Here's this guy and he can look so wounded and then be so hysterical in the next beat. And there's, you know, he's always compelling on screen, at least in, you know, until the last uh, few years. My, uh, my, I guess now ex aunt in law, uh, <laughs> shout out, shout out Meg. Hey, um, Meg. She used to, she was an actor coming up in New York and she and she and Bruce used to bartend together. Oh, cool. Um, you know, as they were both auditioning and all this. And she would always say that Bruce was like the most sort of genuine, charming guy. You know, such charisma, like he was the bartender that would always have the the ladies sort of buzzing around him and everything like that. And I think, you know, she would say sort of that what you got from a John McClane type role or on Moonlighting is like that's who he was, which I think is pretty great. Yeah, I love that. Um, You know, and then obviously I think, you know, maybe things may have changed as he became like the mega star. But um, but yeah, it's great to know that he was like a humble you know, working actor coming up and everything like that. But um, obviously, like Die Hard was the star making role, right? Right. And the John, the John McClane uh, will probably be forever, you know, who he is. Yeah. Or who sure. he is viewed as. But as you say, like he had the range to do like anything from a look who's talking or a death becomes her. Like, yes. I mean, it was all <laughs> over the place. Yeah. Pulp Fiction. Um, yeah. Like I said, 12 Monkeys. It's just like, yeah, he was phenomenal in, in everything. I feel like he holds the crown as being like the funniest action guy. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Him. I mean, the only guys who are close, I think, is like maybe like Kurt Russell is good at that. And mm-hmm. uh, Mel Gibson in his prime was yeah, was a funny guy. But, you know, Bruce, I feel like he sort of paved the way to be like the, you know, the wisecracking smart ass uh but char- you know, boyish charm. Yeah, 100% style of, agree. Of humor or whatever. I'm trying to think of like my favorite shit that he was in that's not action. Yeah, I mean, Sixth Sense is one of those like perfect movies. Yeah. Or as you said, The Fifth Element or Twelve Monkeys. Amazing. Do you remember um, his turn as Jimmy the Tulip Tudeschi in The Whole Nine Yards with Matthew yes, Perry? Yes, man. He was <laughs> awesome, dude. Didn't he, he had was... a movie called Bandits that was good? I mean, yes. He did a lot of a lot of good shit. Oh, dude, Sin City. Oh man, that movie fucks. Um, loved it. Loved his character in that. Also, really loved um, his turn as himself in Ocean's Twelve. <laughs> yes. yes, that was amazing. 
It's awesome. Yeah, he was a dude never afraid to like play against type, right? Agreed. Huge respect for the man. Um, I, I feel, you know, I feel melancholy. I feel a little wistful that, um, we're reflecting on the, on the genius performer. Yeah. Uh, that Bruce Willis is over such sad circumstances. Right. Well, and we just kind of have to hope that, you know, aphasia is something that apparently can be treated. Um, oh, great. You know, if, if you get the right, you, you know, work with the right doctors, it just depends on the severity or what the, what the underlying cause of the condition itself, um, is. But, you know, we can be hopeful that Bruce Willis, I'm, I'm sure he's working with the absolute best professionals that there of are to, 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 to try to rehabilitate some because, you know, first and foremost, he's, you know, you see him, um, as a, I see him as a family man, like, in in this very like uh modern sprawling interesting family and still you know close with Demi and even with Ashton Kutcher and all those folks and so we just hope that you know that the that he's able to rehab and enjoy quality time with his family first and foremost but you know who knows uh medical science is a crazy wonderful thing and um maybe we haven't heard the last of Bruce Willis absolutely i feel like his i feel like his life story is a you know is a movie in its own right. And, you Absolutely. know, I feel, like, I feel like if there's a guy who could make a comeback, it's probably Bruce. So Definitely. we'll be thinking about him. Um, that, that prompts me to say, we'll definitely need to revisit his, uh, his action catalog in the near future on a six degrees of Schwarzenegger. Yes, sir. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I hope everyone is keeping well, keeping safe and enjoying their spring. And, um, We'll be back. All right. And there's the six degrees of Schwarzenegger guys. And uh, that's another great show here on the feed. I don't know if you want to talk about it. Uh, Ryan. Yeah, of course. I love to talk about it as CEO. It's my job and duty to talk about the shows on our, on our network. Now the six degrees guys of Schwarzenegger, they're fantastic. I listened to their podcast. Sounds like these guys have a, a style and um, they're very, both the Bruce Willis and the six degree guys, they have a, a very, uh, almost, almost a professional because <laughs> not to say that I'm not a professional, but I wanted voices that were different than mine and different than yours, different than Doug's because I don't want a vacuum on our network. I like that people come from different ages, different backgrounds, whether it's a social or educational or even whatever. And I like that uh, these uh, six degree guys, what they've done is, is they cover source anchor films. Yes, but they just, they kind of do the last action hero stuff that they, they cover whatever, Whatever film fits the the action hero films, that's sort of like Six Degrees of Bacon. Kevin Bacon, they do the Six Degrees of Schwarzenegger. Very clever idea. Uh, but they do a very good job breaking down movies. They usually about four or five episodes. They'll cover a movie. I think it's a great idea. Uh, unlike me for my Rocky stuff, you know, I take 20 episodes to do a movie. So these guys, they do a great job breaking things down. And uh, so I appreciate them and them being on the network. Yeah. And I really, really, really enjoyed their... Um... Their Commando episode, and then also Raw Deal. Um, I love when they talk about Arnold movies, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's a, a great format and uh, another show that I'm really glad is on the network. So, Ryan, there's so many Bruce Willis films yeah. over the, the last 30 years, 35 years, and we've talked about um, probably some of the, the bigger ones, but are there any films that jump out to you that you would say if i was programming a bruce willis movie night these are the three to five films that mm. i would play well yeah, well we can always talk about this are we talking about the standard ones or maybe the ones that aren't so obvious it's your night man <laughs> well it's bruce's night okay let me do a quick look here so i'm gonna i'm gonna take away from the obvious ones like you know course, paul fish and the diehards and the ones that people already kind of know a uh, one that I loved, I loved, and I saw it in the theaters, and I love it, and I because I have a crush on him. Yeah, it sounds like I have a lot of crush on a lot of actors. I don't, but there's a couple that I do, and she happens to be in this film too, and that's Kate Blanchett, and the movie's Bandits, mm. and yeah, that's a very underrated fun film. It came out in 2001, and it's a uh, it also has Billy Bob Thornton in yeah. it, and that's just a fun fun movie. Uh, have you seen it? Um, yeah, yeah, it's Barry Levinson, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but yeah, you know, it's that almost feels like a movie that, and people always talk about, you know, movies not being made like that anymore. And that feels like a movie that in this day and age, just there wouldn't be a place for it. Right. You know, yeah. just, just because it's just 
it's got that certain level of quirkiness to it that like, I don't know. Streaming has changed everything though, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it has. Uh, I know I, I, this 2001, you're still there. These are the last days nearing the last days of kind of just film films, but bandits go see it. If you haven't seen, it, I know the Bruce guys are in the 2000s now on their TV, on their, uh, on their podcast feed. So we're, we're going to get to that shortly. Uh, of course, another one that came out just before that, which is an amazing performance by Bruce and, uh, another M. Night Shyamalan, but, and a much better film than Sixth Sense, in my opinion. The re, cause the rewatchability of Unbreakable, uh, it's such an incredible, incredible performance and original story by M. Night. Again, Bruce able to pick somehow, be able to pick the right roles or these, these unique roles that Arnold or Sly can't do. So Bruce had that chameleon effect to be able to do these type of films. Yeah, and uh, Unbreakable is my favorite M. Night Shyamalan movie, hands down. Yeah. I think it's one of the most well-directed films of that time period. It's so self-assured. Um, there's, you know, you talk about movies where, like, there's no mistakes. Uh, and that's a movie where, like, M. Night, every decision he made was 100% on point. It's another Bruce Willis performance I really, really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the aspects of that movie I really, really like is the interaction with his son. Um, and there's a scene towards the end of the movie where they're, they're eating, I think, breakfast. It's been a while since I've seen that movie. And his son figures out that he's the quote unquote superhero. Mm. And there's very little dialogue in the scene. And it's all sort of told between the two of them, uh, with the emotions that they're playing with. And that's a, a, a that's a really, really powerful film. I, I think it, it, it covers a lot of different, um, sort of, ideas and themes and it was almost a deconstruction of the superhero movie and uh it's a movie that i really enjoy now of course we can't uh can't forget i think sometimes we sleep on this one how amazing was sin city oh well yeah i mean sin city was sort of the real sort of explosion of like that green screen filmmaking right um but it was green screen for a reason which i really appreciate about robert rodriguez is You know, he's like, these are good. It's going to look like a fake world. You know, it's going to look like a comic book. So I I love the fact that he took technology and he ramped it up as far as he could and played with colors and things like that. And Sin City has this cool throwback vibe because it's based on those Frank Miller stories that were sort Mm -hmm. of based on hard boiled ideas. Um, but yeah, Bruce is great in that movie. That's a, that's a, that movie is is loads and loads of fun. What about you? you got another one? Yeah, oh, um, I have I have um, I think uh, two that I'd probably want to talk about. Sure. I, I don't know if you're f- familiar with 2006, um, the 2006 movie Lucky Number Sledden. Yes. Yeah, I've seen it. I've only seen it the one time, but I saw it and I enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's just a, a a really sort of it's another it's a crime movie but it's got a level of humor to it i think bruce is great in it um and uh it's yeah if 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 you haven't seen it i, I definitely think it's worth it, it's worth watching um you i am going to mention it, oh, sorry, what's that part, uh, part of the problem i have with that film i think and this is i'm sure he's a nice enough fella i i'm not a big josh hartnett guy and i don't think many people are okay and i <laughs> He seems to suck the charisma out of movies. And I don't, so I think when I, you know, he has the starring role in the second billion as Bruce. And I, I just didn't run to it because of him possibly. I think if anyone else had been in it uh, other than him, and I don't, I have nothing against the guy, but I did, I've given him all I can as far as trying to watch him in a film, even to watch him like a movie like Pearl Harbor, which, you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, he just seems to not act very well. And I don't know if he's gotten better over the years or. Yeah, no, I think it's also one of those things that that guy became a star in spite of himself. Like, there was a point where, like, everybody was just becoming a star if you had a certain look. Yeah, yeah. One one other movie I'll point out is uh, 2010's Red, which I think is yes. yeah, you got just one. another super fun movie. Um, the chemistry he has with everybody in that film is, is great. Um, of course, you've got a great John Malkovich performance. You've got uh, Helen Mirren. Um, but then you've also got um, a really, really 
cool kind of back and forth he has with Mary Louise Parker as well, which I think is really, really cool. That's just a, a really fun, uh, not really heavy action movie. All right, we got another show to turn over to? Yeah, um, so now we're going to jump to Doug and Seiko for oh. their thoughts. Together? They're talking together? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear what they have to say. There is Bruce Willis news. The poor man has aphasia. Have you yeah. I, I have. I have. And I was actually just talking to my future wife uh, about dementia and like brain um targeted illnesses and mm-hmm. they freak me out man once once you start to lose your cognitive function it's like to see somebody deteriorate at the rate that they do it's really it scares the crap out of me yeah and and well we've all seen bruce willis deteriorate in front of our very eyes because he's keep making those awful movies from what i hear it's some kind of scheme to get as much money out of his as a little time Bruce is able to give as possible. That's what I was going to ask you. How, how much of that do you think was, was um, filmmakers trying to capitalize on his like deteriorating mental capacity by having him do these God awful films just for a few bucks. It kind of reminds me of the whole thing with uh, the creator of Spider-Man to the point where he kept being dragged into movies, which was kind of cute. You know, he would say Excelsior or some stuff. But in the end, he was just being trotted out, obviously, you know, incapacitated. Yeah. He was just trotted out to to uh, make a buck off of him. It, uh, I guess that's what happens when you have managers surrounding you who are basically behave like vultures. And I well, think that's exactly it. The I people think in Hollywood that's are what soulless. happened to Bruce. Mm-hmm. He was part of a big machine. And the th- and I think you have to have your wits about you when you're in that machine because they will just use you. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the end of this, uh, Bruce Willis's career right now is basically him being chewed up and spit out by that very machine he's been a big part of. Yeah, and it's sad because you saw how he started and came up and, and the kind of content that he was putting out. Mm-hmm. And to see him, I mean, you a, a, a real solid career, you kind of go out with a bang and whatever – field you're in you know you want to retire on a good solid note well, I would but he, yeah he he this it this past few years have been so sad to see him fizzle the way he has yes and if you look at the likes of say peter fonda who went out with an oscar he won an oscar for a movie he did i think with his daughter called on golden pond it was a really dignified ending to his career It bookended his career. He got an Oscar for it, and he just bowed out gracefully. I think that's the best way to go. Like Stallone got his, uh, what was it, Golden Globe, and then he got his uh, Oscar nomination. Mm -hmm. That's as good as it got. Mm -hmm. He should have bowed out gracefully after that. He should have quit. He's and we all know Stallone is no Oscar darling, so no, I don't think he's never going to get like a lifetime achievement award. I don't think he's ever going to get any accolades by the Oscars, no, by the Academy Awards. So um, and probably rightfully so. Mm. I mean, he's has, a, in my opinion, he has a checkered career as much as Bruce Willis has because he came up as a comedian, a good comedian, really, mm-hmm. with his moonlighting show, yeah. and I really enjoyed that. I I watched that back in the day. Most of the stuff he did was basically just comedic stuff. And then I think he became a victim of his own success because Die Hard came along and that became his career. Whereas if you really look at what he did in terms of uh, filmography, most of the stuff before that was mostly just, he was a comedian really. Mm -hmm. And he did that well. I mean, we, we, we all, we know Stallone tried his hand at the, the comedy and it didn't work out so well. His, I'm sure Stallone comedian. is funny with his friends, but it's like yeah. singing in the shower. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, you're 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 your your own best audience. And it's when the you- same with Bruce Willis. It's to me, he was always the action star in terms of yeah. he didn't look the part. You know what what I think one of his greatest strengths was when he played the straight man in an in an otherwise funny movie. You sure. Know, when his when his role was supposed to be like the intimidating, quiet, intense guy. Yeah. And uh, the whole nine yards comes to Unbreakable. mind. Unbreakable. Good, um, good example. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, I don't know his, his action stuff. Like he did a handful of action movies, but he wasn't the quintessential action star. Die Hard was, was really the only thing he was known for. Yes. And he did a ton of those. Yeah. A ton of them. And then he did a bunch of uh, bad B movie action movies when he went into his straight to video phase. And really that's when I kind of tuned out on Bruce uh, until I think Reds, I, I did like Reds, which is kind of one of his better movies in his lad- later years. He's not he's not an actor that I that I really explored a lot. You know, I, I don't know a lot of his ancillary movies. I know the main ones. I've seen the main ones, but you know, I didn't really care enough to uh, to go see those those you know fringe ones, those fringe films of his. Oh, I well, I don't run away from them when they when they come across my screen. You know, mm-hmm. when they're streaming or when they're on somewhere, that's yeah. fine. It's just everything after 2000, say 2014, I avoid like the plague. And I think everybody should, because I don't think they have any bearing on the talents and capabilities of one Bruce Willis. It's a shame well, it's, what happened to that guy. Yeah, it is it is a shame to see his decline and everything. But I mean... We, uh, you know, the, the stuff that we got from him, like he, he has a podcast on the last of the action heroes network for a reason. You know, he has oh, yeah. done some, he's done, he's done some things that are, that are noteworthy. So yes. Although know. I do listen to that regularly and they yeah. have like this rating system where instead of giving him, um, numbers or, um, letters, they just give him a, a Bruce Willis as a, as an A and yeah, a Bruce yeah. is a, like passable grade. Uh-huh. And they tend to give out a lot of Bruce Bruce W's. Yeah, <laughs> it just barely passes the 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 grade. Well, so, in in honor of of Bruce Willis and in honor of the uh, where there's a Willis, there's a way. Let's let's rate his career as a whole as a on a rating scale of Bruce Willis. What would you give him? I would give him a Bruce Bruce Wheel with a W I W I Bruce, Bruce Wee. Okay, Bruce right. Wee. That's fair enough. I would I would drop him one of the L's in there. So I'm going to give him a Bruce Will. Okay. Just based on, like I said, I haven't seen his entire filmography, but based on the stuff that I know and I like from him, is definitely you know Bruce. Uh, so Bruce basically, Will, when you L. haven't seen that stuff, you're grading on a curve. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. And for the record, I happen to love "Look Who's Talking." I so do I. So do I. I think the six down under guys did a. Uh did a podcast on that and it's like their yeah. most listened to podcast ever. And <laughs> yeah. I, I, I loved it because I loved look who's talking back in the day. Not the sequel though. I saw the first sequel. I didn't even bother to, to watch the one with the dogs, but oh. the first one was, it was perfect for, you know, an early ninety early nineties comedy. And I was, I was a kid when it came out and I just loved it. I, I yeah. ate it up. Yeah, of course. So, talking baby. You know, I, what more do you want? I, I, I wish Bruce all the best in the, you know, the twilight of his life. And, um, Oh, well, know, he's man. rich beyond the dreams of avarice. So I'm sure he's well taken care of. And from what For I've sure. seen, he has, uh, uh, a family who cares about him. So I'm sure he's fine. And he probably has a hundred servants taking care of his every need. <laughs> so I don't think we should be worried. We're not weeping for Bruce. He's not in here. Scientology or anything. They're not going to bleed <laughs> dry. He's fine. He's just, he, he stopped making awful movies. So in my opinion, mm. that's a good thing. I applaud this. I'm happy. Uh, I don't have to, uh, switch on Netflix and, and, uh, see four more Bruce Willis trailers of stuff I never want to see. Right. I'm good. I can mm-hmm. just watch Die Hard another hundred or maybe another 200 times and reminisce. That's that. Well, here's to Bruce, I guess, right? Here's to Bruce. All right. So that was Doug and Seiko. I think they were sitting down and recording for something else. So they were able to. to oh, okay. To, uh, I, yeah. to, they got to an Arnold me. project. They got an yeah. Arnold project. They probably plugged in that clip, but uh, yeah, those guys are, uh, well, of course I know Seiko from his Mel Gibson podcast, Hugging the Cactus on Our Feed and uh, Doug of Rocket Men of Fame, of course, and um, look forward to their Arnold podcast as well. So yeah, I, I think um overall there's a lot you can say about Bruce Willis and his career and So my question is, Craig. Yeah. I'm looking at his filmography here and this is it's a heartbreaking. 
It, it, it is. It could, meaning from 2017 to 2022, he's got, I'm counting quick, like 20, 25 films. Yeah. And not one of them are anything. And it's heartbreaking because now we know about this condition. How long back has this been happening? Yeah, and I think that's things people are going to sort of be looking at. I mean, there's um, there's the 2019 movie Motherless Brooklyn, which was a Edward Norton movie, and um, people have talked about his performance in that. And then even on Broadway, he did Misery, where people had talked about noticing an earpiece. Um, so I think that's going to be something that's probably going to be speculated for a long time is like exactly when did his ability to perform really start to get, you know, impacted. Well, you could argue the direct to video days officially started after 2014 Sin City, a Dame to Kill For. And I'm looking here, the rest of his films that he stars in. Like that, he's the star or direct a video. Yeah, but I mean, no, well, you don't have 2018's Death Wish, though. Oh, right. Uh, that that's one. Okay, you're right. One there, Mother's Brooklyn, two, and Glass in 2019. Sure. Okay, fair enough. I wonder. See, now speaking of Glass with M. Night, so but yeah, okay, so three movies out of 30. Uh, like it really is almost 30 movies since 2014 that are direct to video. Uh, I wonder though, with Glass, if M Night or saw or got any kind of indication, or is this condition that he has right now is this something that can come on in six months to a year? Like, I yeah, I, I really don't know, but I've never, I, I didn't see Glass either, and because I hadn't heard great things about it, but it's my understanding that in a lot of Glass, he's got the hood on. Mm. Interesting. So I wonder if he's covering an earpiece, just like we're saying. Exactly. Exactly. Oh wow. But either way, Ryan, I think the I, I don't know why they finally decided, or Bruce and his family finally decided it was time to retire. I know there's been a lot of scrutiny uh, surrounding these decisions to make these direct-to-video projects. I know we've sort of talked about it a little on our show. I know the Red Letter Media guys devoted two and a half episodes to mm. these movies, and they started to speculate that there was something going on. They they actually showed examples of scenes where it didn't sound like his voice. Oh, it almost wow. sounded like a robot created voice or somebody doubling him. But I think, I, I mean, the fact that he's retiring is, is, um, is sad because, you know, he's done, he, you know, we're not going to get any more new Bruce Willis movies. But I think the other thing is it sort of at least points to the fact that, it puts those all of those direct to video movies it puts them in a new light we all knew they were garbage we all knew they were trash and we all thought of them as bruce willis not caring about his legacy and just going for quick two day paydays which you know you can't fault guys for but with somebody like a body of work like bruce willis is it hurts because you think wow this guy really doesn't give a shit about his legacy right and now you flip that and you put it in perspective and say, okay, this was a guy that was probably trying to do as much work as he could while he still could to take care of his family. And there's probably all kinds of arguments we can have about which way he should have gone. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, they were his decisions. I do think some of the producers behind these movies were a little unscrupulous and, you know, um, but at the end of the day, he was getting $2 million for a couple days work. So, um, but I think the really important thing, Ryan, is 10 years from now, 20 years from now, none of these movies are going to matter. Nobody's going to talk about them. No. But they'll still talk about Moonlighting. They'll still talk about Die Hard. They'll still talk about Pulp Fiction. They'll still talk about Sin City. Um, they'll still talk about all the movies that he did that made an impact and had really, really good performances. And uh, I, I think... You know, at the end of the day, his legacy is intact. And as we talked about, I, I, I really think that he sort of opened the door to grounding action movies again and having action movies that had believable characters that you actually thought were um, that could get hurt and did get hurt. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think at, that, at the end of the day, that's going to be, you know, his lasting impact. And I think 
again, with this announcement and, and the retirement and, you know, the unfortunate nature of it, I think it's going to force people maybe to reassess his overall career and, and maybe it's going to put it in a new light and some people are going to get a new appreciation of it. Well, it's like, you know, he hasn't passed away, but his career has now ended. Uh, and that's what we know Bruce as. I don't know him personally. He's not my father or friend or brother. So I only know him as a, as a screen star. So it, it it's over, you know, it's done. We're not going to get anything more from him. Um, well, there are actually a couple of movies still set to be. Well, I know, <laughs> well, no, I, uh, I know he's got stuff coming, but what I mean is, is yeah. like, it, the career is all for all intents and purposes over. So, um, you know, like any time a movie star or an actor or sorry, even music star, when they pass away, often they go back, people go, Oh, you know, he was here. He was here or she was here the whole time. I never appreciate it. So I think we're going to get that with Bruce, Bruce. Um, we're not going to get an in memoriam, so to speak, at <laughs> next year's Oscars of his, but it's sad. It's sad that it kind of went out with a, it's almost just as sudden as a death in some ways. It, it feels that way. And people no, are giving absolutely. Me- and I think uh, it's important that you pointed out that we actually have an opportunity to celebrate somebody while they're still with, it, with yeah. us. And I doubt anybody related to the Bruce Willis family is going to listen to this, but the fact that, you know, they, they, you know, they always say appreciate people when they're here, you know, it doesn't matter after somebody dies, how much you love their music or how much you love their movies or how much you love their books. doesn't matter to that person anymore. So celebrate them while they're here. And and that's really what um, we wanted to do with this. Um, I do know as we're recording, Ryan, we might get some more um, comments from uh, other people on the network. I believe Sean Malloy um, might've been submitting something. So, um, I think yeah. unless you have anything else to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I should. Just in case the guys from Van Dammit or, or I Must Break This Podcast, uh, who, who am I missing? Am I missing somebody else? Oh, man, they're going to be pissed. Yeah, I know. Can you believe it? Uh, who no, do we I got don't, I don't think so. I think, yeah, I just want to say the Van Dammit guys. Oh, the drunk, uh, drunk Bond. Of course, Drunk Bond. Jack from Drunk Bond. Yeah. So, okay, that that should be everyone. So, if they do send something, I just want to say those shows were made. Jack from the Drunk Bond covering the, James, covering the James Bond films. He's fantastic. He's covering them solo right now, but also releasing classic episodes like you've done uh, with Slycast. Uh, and he's doing uh, Stallone stuff. He's doing Rocky movies. It's awesome. He's actually a bigger, he's a bigger Rocky fan than he is a James Bond fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, either uh, way, um, yeah. at, the end, at the end of this, I might drop in a couple of those comments, but either way, Ryan, um, I know this was kind of an impromptu loose discussion. Um, we didn't have any sort of roadmap on where we wanted to go with this, but, uh, we just wanted to take a couple of minutes to show our appreciation for the, uh, the, the career that was Bruce Willis. And, uh, and, awesome. uh, thank you for taking a couple of minutes to sit down with me and, uh, help work through our thoughts. It's my pleasure as always, Craig. And I always look forward to recording with you and look forward to doing it again soon. Absolutely. Take care, Ryan. You bet. Hello, listeners. Sean here from I Must Break This Podcast, the Dolph Lundgren fan podcast. And I'm here to say a little bit about the great pillar of Hollywood that is Mr. Bruce Willis. Now, recently, the sad news hit the world earlier this past week that Willis was stepping away from acting due to health issues. His extremely prolific output of the last couple years has been the subject of rumors, and now that it's officially been confirmed, It makes it all the more hard to believe that here soon, we won't be seeing any more Bruce Willis movies. Now granted, like any actor, Bruce has quite a few bad films on his resume, yet he also has quite a few classics of not just the action genre, but also within the comedy and dramatic genres that are important to note. In short, Bruce has always felt like that cool relative who was always around hanging out at family reunions, cracking jokes. Yet, like so many in our lives, we realize that perhaps we may have taken him for granted, and we may have unfairly forgotten about his numerous contributions to the world of film. So, in honor of Bruce, or Bruno, as he's referred to by many, I thought I would share my picks for the top five underrated Bruce Willis performances. Obviously, many cite Bruce Willis's roles in Die Hard and Moonlighting as the ones that are his best And yes, while these are roles that have gone down as being somewhat iconic, the man has done so much more, with over 144 acting credits to his name. Sure, I'd love to spend time swooning over the mean-spirited but 
ultimately fun Shane Black flick, The Last Boy Scout, where Bruce played a surly private investigator embroiled in the world of professional football. I could also go on about how Die Hard with a Vengeance is superior to the original Die Hard film, as it has fun throwing John McClane around the streets of New York like a pinball as he frantically races to defuse a number of strategically placed bombs. But I won't. My time here is limited, so instead, here, in no particular order, are the best Bruce Willis performances that you may have seen, but have most likely forgotten. Number one, Last Man Standing. In this flick, directed by the great Walter Hill, Bruce Willis plays a Clint Eastwood-esque man with no name, who steps into a 1920s town and plays two rival mobs against one another. It's a slightly updated retelling of the classic Yojimbo, only instead of swords and samurais, it's the Prohibition era, with dual guns blasting away. Featuring a killer cast, including Bruce Dern, Christopher Walken, Patrick Kilpatrick, and David Patrick Kelly, Last Man Standing is a wonderful throwback to the westerns of yesterday. Number two, Mercury Rising. From 1998, this tends to get a little maudlin, and it's received a lot of critical hate over the years, but I've always admired how strong the performances are. Bruce plays a cop who must protect a young autistic boy after he cracks a secret code. Alec Baldwin plays the leader of the shadowy government group who is after the unlikely duo. Anyone who enjoys the interplay between Bruce and Haley Joel Osment in The Sixth Sense will most likely see a similar interplay here as well, which actually came prior to The Sixth Sense. Uh, Number three, The Kid. Released by Disney in 2000, it's on the record that Bruce did this film out of a contractual obligation with Disney. But... It's a truly heartwarming story. Bruce stepped out of the action genre that he found himself somewhat pigeonholed into over the years and plays an uptight image consultant who teams up with an eight-year-old version of himself in an effort to get a second chance at life. Like Mercury Rising, Bruce is sometimes at his best when he has interplay with young children. And the results are fun, charming, tragic at times, but also a delight to see. Number four, The Story of Us. Directed by Rob Reiner, Bruce Willis and Michelle Pfeiffer craft the ups and downs of a marriage. It may not put the concept of marriage in the best light, but it also doesn't hold back. And it's also a treat to see Bruce stepping out of the action genre and really delivering his acting chops. This was made at a time when actors could successfully move back and forth between genres with moderate success. Studios took chances then, and so did plenty of actors. And number five, 16 Blocks. This, folks, is one of my favorites. Bruce plays a burnt-out detective who must protect a witness and get him to the courthouse on time. Standing between them, 16 Blocks of Crooked Detectives on the Mean Streets of New York. Directed by Richard Donner and co-starring Mo Steff, 16 Blocks is a tour de force of acting and directing talent That is thrilling from beginning to end. So there's my picks, folks. Uh, You may disagree, but there's no denying that a piece of Hollywood will be absent now with Bruce Willis's retirement. Very few other stars have exuded the same kind of charisma, cool, attitude, and charm that Bruce Willis is known for. And while he may not necessarily be gone per se, each one of his performances, including these, stand out just a little brighter. I wish Bruce Willis nothing but the best and hope he enjoys this stage in his life as he relaxes with his loved ones. Bruce, you can rest assured that you have left a stamp on a variety of cinematic genres that will not be forgotten. This has been Sean from I Must Break This Podcast. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk with you all next time. Evan Moody, Andrew Guthius, Nothing Worthwhile, Van Damme, a podcast about Jean-Claude Van Damme. We are our part of the last of the Action Heroes Podcast Network. Not talking about Jean-Claude, getting a quick, few quick thoughts on the recent news for Bruce Willis. Andrew Gruthius, my partner, for the past few years grew. Bruce Willis has been shielded reportedly by family and friends. About a week ago, news came out that uh, Bruce has been diagnosed with aphasia, a condition that causes loss of the ability to understand or express speech. 
and Bruce Willis and his family came to the quote-unquote difficult decision that he could no longer work. Uh, Andrew, thoughts on the news of Bruce Willis? Tragic in several different ways. Uh, first and foremost, uh, his health. It's uh, it's very sad to hear that he's ill. Um, and uh, tragic for his fans like us uh, because we are losing one, yeah, at least for now or for the foreseeable future, we're, we're losing someone we have admired so much from even before he became a world-renowned superstar. We loved him on Moonlighting. Uh, on TV and for someone, you know, at that time, for someone to make the jump, the incredible successful jump from TV to movies, uh, which he did, um, was, was, a, they were not exactly a dime a dozen. Many people tried and failed and Bruce made it. Um, he had a couple of films, I think, before Die Hard. He did a movie called, uh, well, his first movie was Blind Date, which is a Blake Edwards movie. I think that movie's hilarious. I think he's great in it. It's something that I watch every now and then. Uh, he did a movie called Sunset with uh, James Garner. He played the silent screen cowboy Tom Mix. Uh, and I think then, there might have been one more in there, uh, I'm forgetting, but then came Die Hard, and that solidified him as a bona fide movie star, and he never really looked back. Of course, he had, you know, like everybody, they have ups and downs over their careers, a lot of clunkers, but... A lot of hits as well, you know, the Die Hard franchise we talk we talk about, uh, Armageddon, The Sixth Sense, um, even 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 movies like uh, like uh, Twelve Monkeys, you know, he was he was really good in, and you know, he was the kind of guy who's like when he wanted to be great, he could, um, and you know, like you said, the last few years he's he's been sort of uh, doing these direct to whatever movies and it seems like now sort of we have like an explanation for that maybe he was trying to you know line up his finances maybe he knew maybe either he knew shit was going bad or he really didn't know what he was doing uh i've heard uh, I, i've read some things about that but either way um bruce willis is one of the all-time greats um as far as movie stars go seems like a really fun guy uh, and I hate to think that he's that he's suffering, that he's ill. Uh, that's the real tragedy here. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, I don't know a lot about the condition. It might be degenerative, although maybe there's treatment. Maybe we're not saying. Maybe this is, uh, you know, see you soon. Um, I hope that's what it is. I hope it's not goodbye. Uh, but God bless Bruce Willis because he deserves he deserves that and more. This was supposed to be a quick. Uh, <laughs> well, this. he just told me before we started recording, <laughs> we'll make this one quick. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, and then Bruce Willis and uh, watching the <laughs> clock spin. And Bruce Willis. <laughs> I thought this was a two man conversation <laughs> podcast. Well, you certainly laid out quite a bit of stuff on Bruce Willis. I think of two things when I when I heard the news. Uh, I am always sad, and, and I don't care if you're a multi-million dollar actor or uh, you know a high school janitor. Uh, when whenever somebody's hand is played and you have to say goodbye uh, to something you love before you're ready to say goodbye, um, that always that always saddens me. Um, I think the truest form of freedom is being able to wake up and say, you know what, today I don't want to go on the on this set, and I'm going to say goodbye, and I have the finances or the means or whatever. It is to say goodbye. So I'm sad for Bruce Willis in the sense that um, his medical condition forced his hand and perhaps he's saying goodbye to acting before he's ready to say goodbye to acting. In terms of his career, uh, I mean, Andy laid it out there really, really well. Uh, I think of, um, you know, a roller coaster of a career, a lot of high marks, like you mentioned, obviously the Die Hard uh, franchise. Um, you know, Pulp Fiction, The Sixth Sense, Twelve Monkeys, films like that, and of course, there's a lot of clunkers in there. I think Bruce Willis, as an actor, brought an affability and a a a, um, a a sense of realism to action movies. You know, Die Hard. He was, you know, a regular guy. It was just a cop off the street thrown into this incredible situation. And I think prior to Bruce Willis, our action heroes, you know, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, were 
you know, indestructible, almost uh, almost ridiculous like at times. Yeah. I think Die Hard brought a sense of uh, realism, a sense of fun, a sense of sarcasm to action, and, and uh, you know, I think that's what I'll remember most about Bruce Willis. Yeah, me too. Uh, so yeah, God, Godspeed. Uh, I, you know, I just like I said, like I like we keep saying over and over again, the next ten years are going to suck. Uh, we're seeing our our heroes become human, uh, but hopefully, like I said, this is uh, this is a temporary uh, this is a temporary thing. Yeah. That's what I'm that's what I'm I'm hoping. That's all we can do, really. Yeah, I don't so. think medical conditions like this are, are temporary. Yeah. They're saying that perhaps as early as 2017, he had cognitive decline, mm. and they had people helping him around on on movie sets and things of that nature. Um, but yes, I hope he gets treatment. I hope uh, obviously. His overall health and well-being is is most important, and um, I'm curious to hear what the other fellows on the Last of the Action Heroes podcast network think about Bruce yes. Willis. As you said earlier, I'm sure we'll we'll mine Bruce's career and take 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 a look at some of his stuff in long form. Uh, but we here at Nothing Worthwhile, Van Dammit, wanted to give us uh, some thoughts on Bruce Willis. And thank you very much. All and right. uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. The outstanding lead actor in a drama series is Bruce Willis for Moonlighting. Bruce Willis adds this Emmy to a People's Choice Award and a Golden Globe Award. His other television credits include Miami Vice and The Twilight Zone. <laughs> Woohoo! God bless America. Oh, gosh. Look at that. So, <clears throat> it is almost exactly uh, three years. Uh, it'll actually be Tuesday. It'll be three years um, since I tested for this part on Moonlighting. And uh, it's been a very interesting three years. Um, I would like to share this award, this Emmy, with everyone that I work with on Moonlighting. It has been said that a... An Emmy for Moonlighting or a vote for Moonlighting is a vote for anarchy because uh, we spend a little more money, we take a little more time to do what we do. Uh, this award for me uh, and is a vote for our show, and I think um, people want to see better quality work, and if it takes a little more time or a couple more dollars, what the hell, you know? <laughs> the point is, uh, it's a very good show, and we are all very proud of it. I share this award with Glenn Karen, who gave me the job. Yeah! Thank you very much. Uh, Glenn created this show. Uh, he put this thing together out of his mind, and now three years later, it is uh, still a wonderful, wonderful thing for me to do every day when I get up. I also share this award with Sybil Shepherd, who unfortunately could not be here tonight because she was carrying ten and a half pounds of baby. Um, <laughs> She wanted to come, and she told me to say hello to everyone here, and uh, I said, uh, I would also like to thank all the writers and all the people who work in that blue building over uh, at Fox. Uh, it would be very, very difficult for me to do my job without the wonderful writing of Roger Director, Glenn Karen, Chick Egley, uh, Ron Osborne, Jeff Reno, Karen Hall. Um, I would also like to thank Jerry Finnerman. A wonderful, wonderful cinematographer who uh, unfortunately was not nominated for an award this year, but for the past three years has given us uh, an incredible uh, look on our show. Uh, I'd like to thank my mom, who right now is in the hospital recovering from surgery. Where's the camera? Ma, what's up? Look at this. Good. Weighs about four or five pounds. She wanted to know. Uh, well, Lastly, I would like to thank four people who inspired me to be an actor. The first three you know as the Three Stooges. <clears throat> Bo, Larry, and Curly. My pals. Uh, the last person I'd like to thank is Al Pacino, who in 1973, was with his performance in The Godfather, inspired me to be an actor. It's a great job. I'm very proud to be an actor. Thank you very much.